<clears throat> hello, hi, hello everyone, hello English readers, and welcome to this new live read-along of Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Welcome to this reading of the adaptation of Mrs. Dalloway. I forgot to mention I'm Lydie Bureau and I am an English teacher in France. I am also the founder of Lydie's Book Club, in which I host live readings like this one um, of adaptations of classics of English literature, but also contemporary novels of um, the English literature as well, or American literature as well. Um, and I tend to prioritize novels that are written by women, such as Virginia Woolf. And in my book club, in addition to the live read-alongs, the live read-alongs that I do um, for free for people, I also have a membership, um, let's say, um, subscription yeah um in which uh i um i host um once a week live meetings on zoom to discuss the the chapters read over the week and uh also to give the opportunities to my members to uh discuss to have the chance to practice their english with the discussions of books and in general, uh, but more specifically about the reading, about the book that we are reading uh, currently. And uh, also, it can also be about learning English. I mean, the conversation then can take different uh, roads and um, at the same time, you have the chance to be corrected by me and improve this way. Your And I can also learn from you, um, as we teacher often do with our students. Um, it's It really goes both ways. Um, so today we're going to read section seven. I'm sorry, I made a mistake in my story. Uh, so today we're catching up uh, section seven and later uh, around three o'clock I will read section eight which was meant to be uh, the reading of today. So we are catching up with section seven which is the which are the pages from 53 to 59. So if you want to know more about Virginia Woolf and her novel a masterpiece, Mrs. Dalloway, then I invite you to listen to my post to my podcast episode 17 coming out tomorrow about um Virginia Woolf and um understanding more about the context of the writing of this novel and also uh, have a little insight of a little summary of the novel as well. So let's start. Let's start. Let's start. Up. So I'm going to close that. Okay. So here we are. Uh, I'm going to do a quick recap before I get on with the reading of the section. I'm going to recap um, the sec uh, section six that we have read on. When was that on Monday? Yeah. So Monday we read uh, pages 48 to 53. And in this section of the book, it's um, dedicated to Peter Walsh's thoughts um, about his really questioning his life and his life choices and wondering whether he's really in love with um, his, this woman, Daisy, um, and um, he 
He also thinks about um is thinking about the past as well when he was uh he's remembering his time again at uh Burton um in where he uh spent the morning the the summer with uh, his friend Clarissa and her other friend Sally Seton um and he's very surprised to learn that Sally Seton is married to a rich man and lives uh, a grand very uh, uh, grand life in uh, in Manchester when ne near Manchester and she's got a beautiful huge house in Manchester and he's also criticizing um Hugh Whitbread, which was also a friend of Clarissa, and he didn't really like that man. Um, criti um calling him a snob and uh, kind of uh, um, someone that uh, had the the yeah, admiration for the upper class, uh but wasn't from the upper class and had and he is um laughing or is mocking this man um for liking the upper class and having uh a snobbish attitude pretending to be someone that yeah pretending to be someone else and um, pretending to be that he's belong he's belonging to the upper class when he's actually someone from the middle class um so you also have here information uh, about upper class so the words are in bold and that's that can be very useful to kind of understand the two different um, classes and the and um, how it what it refers to. So middle class are people quite well educated um, with their own businesses and they have good jobs. They're like doctors or lawyers but they're not as rich as the upper class. But they definitely have more money than the other members, than the working class, for example. And the upper class are people that are much more wealthy, who are wealthier. Um, the highest position in uh, so upper class are considered uh, are people considered to have the highest position in, si in society um they can be assimilated to maybe um the mem yeah some members of the royal family for example or upper class and they have more money or power than um, any other people or people from the government as well can be considered as uh upper class yeah so there are different strats in uh, english society and it's still very much present in today's uh, society as well you can still see but i think you can now more than before you can um kind of climb the ladder and reach the middle or the the upper class um more easily or with than than in the beginning of the 20th century people are more educated nowadays and not and have better jobs so they can have they have more chances they have more chances to reach the upper class or the middle class society.
there is a big middle class uh, uh, population, I would say. Nowadays, much more than in the early 20th century. So, yes, so that was it about uh, chapter, uh, not chapter, but the section uh, six. Uh, it was rather short and um, it's mainly Peter Walsh uh, reminiscing about his past life and wondering um, if he is actually in love with Daisy the man that the woman that he would like to marry and is also convincing himself that is not in love anymore with Clarissa but hmm I see I believe there are some there 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 are some feelings here that he's trying to um, hide or um, not listen Okay, so let's continue with section seven. Poor old woman, said Rizia Warren Smith, waiting to cross the street. Oh, poor old creature. Suppose it was a wet night. Where did she sleep at night? And suppose someone passed, like one's, like one's father or someone who had known one in better days. The thin sound of her signing, singing rose up into the air like smoke, almost cheerfully. And if someone sees, what do they matter? Ah, remember this phrase. And if someone sees, what do they matter? It's the phrase that... Um, that uh, who said that that Peter Walsh heard from that same woman who was singing when he get when he stepped out um when he stepped into his taxi and she was singing on the street and he um, gave her a coin and she was singing and if someone sees, what do they matter? So she hears that as well. Well, Rizia Warren Smith also um, listen, her, hears that, that uh, phrase. Since she had been so unhappy for weeks and weeks now, Rizia had been meaning to think to things that happened. Sometimes she almost felt like she must stop pe people in the street if they looked kind, to tell them I'm unhappy. And the words of this old woman singing in the street made her suddenly quite sure that everything was going to be all right. So he made her feel good to uh, listen to that woman actually saying, and if someone said, what does that matter? Yeah, so it's quite soothing in a way for her. They were going to, they were going to Sir William Bradshaw. She thought his name sounded nice. He would make Septimus better at once. So they crossed the street, Mr. and Mrs. Septimus Warren Smith. And was there anything to bring attention to them after all? Was there any, anything to make people think, here is a young man who carries in him the greatest message in the world, who is the happiest man in the world and the unhappiest? Perhaps. They walked more slowly than other people. There was something uncertain in the man's walk. But what was more natural for an officer worker, for an office worker who has not been in the West End on a weekday 
at this time for years, than to keep looking around him at the sky, at everything wonderful and strange. He looked like an office worker, but of the better educated, but of the better educated sort. He wore brown boots. His hands were smooth. His face was intelligent and sensitive. He was one of those self-educated men who has borrowed books from libraries and read them in the evening after work. He had left home when he was still a boy because of his mother and because he could see no future for a poet in his country town. So here we are talking about Septimus Warren Smith. So we are here we are we ha we listen to the narrator's voice here um telling us more details about Septimus and his past. And so, telling only his little sister, he had gone to London, leaving a note behind him. London has swallowed up many millions of men called Smith, not caring about extraordinary first, not caring about extraordinary first names like Septimus. He became shy and nervous, determined to improve himself, and fell in love with Smith with Miss Isabel Cole, who gave talks about Shakespeare. He lent him books, she lent him books, wrote him notes and lit in him the kind of fire that burns only once in a lifetime without heat. He thought her beautiful and wise. He dreamed of her, wrote poems to her, threw them away, and um, wrote poems to her, threw them away. He finished a great work at three o'clock in the morning and ran out to the streets. Mr. Brewer, his boss, knew that something was wrong. He thought highly of young Smith and expected that he would do well if, if he kept his health. So he advised him to play football and invited him to supper. Mr. Brewer was about to raise his salary when something interrupted his plan and took away his best young man, young man, the war. Septimus was one of the first to sign up to the army. He went to France to fight for his country, to save in England, which for him meant Shakespeare's plays, and Miss Isabel Paul in a green dress. In the war, he gained what Mr. Brewer thought he was missing, strengths and ma and manliness he was not he was noticed by his officer evans the two of them were always together sharing fighting quarreling with each other but when e when evans was killed in italy just before the end in autumn 1918 septimus congratulated himself for feeling very little the war had taught him. It was wonderful. He had gone through the whole thing and had survived. When peace came, he was in Italy, staying in the house of an, in of an innkeeper with little tables outside, flowers in pots and daughters making hats. Remember who makes hats? Who? Yeah. Yeah, who makes hats? It's Rezia's sister. He became engaged to Rezia, the younger daughter. One evening, when in terror, he realized that he could not feel. For now, that it was all over, the peace agreement signed and the dead buried he had these sudden moments of fear he could not feel as he looked into the room where the daughters 
sat making hats. He could see them, he could hear them, but he could not feel. He stayed among them, listening to their work, their laughter, and felt protected. But when he woke alone early in the morning, the bed was falling. He was falling. So he married Rizia with her little artist's fingers. It's a lady's hat that matters most, she would say. When they walked out together, she would examine every hat that passed. Beautiful, she would whisper, making Septimus, making Septimus look, too. The beauty was behind glass to him. It could not taste, it could not feel. His brain was perfect. It could read, it could calculate. So it must be the fault of the world then that he, that he could not feel. It might be possible, Septimus thought, looking at England from the train window after they had crossed the sea that the world itself is without meaning. They rented rooms in a nice house of Tottenham Court Road where Rizia sat at the table decorating hats for their landladies for their landlady, Mrs. Filmer, and her friends. The English are so serious, she would say, putting her arms around Septimus. At the officer, at the office, Miss, Mr. Brewer was proud of him. Septimus had won medals. Rizia wanted to see London. Together, they went to the Tower of London and to Buckingham Palace to stand in a crowd to see the king. And there were the smart English shop. Hat shops, dress shops, shops with leather bags in the window where she would stand gazing. But what she wanted was children. Five years of marriage passed. She must have a son. Like she must have a son like Septimus, she said. But nobody could be like Septimus, so gentle, so serious, so clever. Mrs. Filmer's daughter was expecting another baby. Rizia could not grow old and have no children. She was very lonely. She was very unhappy. She cried for the first time since they were, they were married. Far away, he heard her crying, but he felt nothing. Each time she cried in this silent, hopeless way, he felt nothing. At last, he dropped his head on his hands like an actor in the play, aware that it was not sincere. He gave up. Now other people must help him. Nothing could reach him. Rizia put him to bed and set and sent for Mr. Mrs. Firmer's family doctor. Dr. Holmes examined him. There was nothing at all the matter, he said. Remember that phrase that she would use um, before when they were at the park and trying to hide the very strange um, uh, behavior of her husband. And it's very, and it, it, and it started from the beginning when Dr. Holmes examined him since uh, the start and um, for him, there is nothing wrong with him. When he felt like that, when he felt like that himself, Dr. Holmes said, it to, to, Dr. Holmes said he took the day off and played golf. Or he went to the theater with his wife. Oh, what a relief. What a kind man, thought Rizia. So maybe maybe just a little bit of distraction will be will be enough, will be sufficient. Then when he feels low, um, then just go to the theater or go play football and all will be fine. So there was nothing the matter except for the crime of not feeling. 
for which human nature had found him guilty and would put him to death. He had not cared when Evans was killed. That was the worst. But he, he had committed other crimes too. He had married his wife without loving her. He had lied to her. He had offended Miss Isabel Paul. He punished, his punishment was death. So the very tormented Septimus here uh, explain, so Virginia Woolf here explains to us um, the real reason why, um, I mean, we knew about the war but also now we have another information is that he married he never loved Razia first, first and also that he was actually in love with someone else before and that woman was Isabel Paul um, and um, he is Punishing himself for not marrying her and betraying her in a way. And uh, also feeling guilty for marrying Aresia and, all, and not having cried. He didn't cry for his friend. So... is a uh, is feeling guilty for a lot of things and and there is no one to listen to him no one that is um mentally strong enough to listen to him it seems and he can't say is he can't say that to his wife. And he can't say that, can't say that to Dr. Holmes because for him there is nothing wrong. So he's stuck in that brain. And um, the only way out is is death. Dr. Holmes came again and brushed it all aside. The headaches, the sleeplessness, fears, dreams, health is mostly in our own control, he said. Septimus must put on weight, play a sport, take up a hobby. Dr. Holmes owed, owed his own excellent health to his interest in old furniture, he said, looking in the mirror. When the fool came again, Septimus refused to see him. Did he indeed? said Miss, Mr. Holmes. And he had to give the charming Miss, Mrs. Smith a friendly push to get past her into her husband's bedroom. So you're in a bad mood? Dr. Holmes said, sitting down by his patient, who had actually talked to his wife of killing himself. So he's, he, he's a kind of um, devaluing or diminishing um, Septimus's um, call for help because for him, this is just being in a bad mood. Wanting to kill yourself, having suicide, suicidal thoughts is just being in a bad mood. He's not taking him seriously. seriously. At all. Was it wasn't a husband responsible responsible for protecting his wife? Wouldn't it be better to do something instead of lying in bed? Well, Dr. Holmes had 40 years experience behind him, and he could promise promise Mr. Smith that there was nothing the matter with him. Next time he came, Dr. Holmes hoped to find to find Smith out of the bed and not worrying 
his charming little wife. Human nature, that horrible creature, was coming after him. With his blood red nose, Dr. Holmes was after him. Holmes came every day. Their only chance was to escape without letting Holmes know. They could go to, it to Italy or anywhere away from Dr. Holmes. But Rizia did not understand him. Dr. Holmes was such a kind man who only wanted to help them. So everyone was asking him. The whole world was shouting, kill yourself, kill yourself for our sakes. But why should he kill himself for their sakes? There was still pleasure, good food, the heat of the sun. And how would one do it? With a knife? With gas? He was too weak. He could hardly lift his hand. It was at that moment. Rizia was out shopping that Evans spoke to him. Evans! Evans! he cried. Then Rizia came in with flowers. Again, the flowers come back there. The element of flowers in the book are coming. Sorry. Then Rizia came in with flowers she had bought from a poor man in the street, wild with terror, because Septimus was talking to himself. She sent at once for Dr. Holmes, since her husband was mad and hardly knew her. You monster, you monster, cried Septimus, seeing human nature, that is, Dr. Holmes, entering the room. Now, what's all this? Talking nonsense to frighten your wife, said, said Dr. Holmes kindly. He would give him something to, ma to make him sleep. And of course, they may go to, Ar to Harley Street if they could afford it. And they had no confidence in him, said Dr. Holmes, looking not quite so kind. Right, so it, it is the very um, disturbing um, moment here for um, Septimus because he, he doesn't see Dr. Holmes as a person but as, as someone that wants him... Um, Um, that wants to to do to hurt him, um, and he sees human nature um, instead of uh, a man. He doesn't. He sees a creature or like some something from his imagination, um, and he he repeats again. And again, that he wants to kill himself, that the only chance for him is, is to die. But Dr. Holmes doesn't seem to soothe him. To soothe is the fact to make someone calmer. And it doesn't seem to, to work really here. So... It's a very um, interesting um, passage. This, this passage also talks more about uh, Septimus's past. And actually, we learn that from the start, he never loved Rizia. And the man that Rizia met in Italy is not the same anymore. And act or or Septimus was showing a pretty picture of himself or, or pretended the whole time when he was in Italy, pretending that he loved her. He pretended to uh, 
to to be someone that um someone normal that that was nothing wrong with him and that it and it didn't really listen to the fact that he could not feel anymore and the fact that he didn't grieve about the war he didn't grieve about his friend Evans who died all of this made him the man that he is in 1923 in the end because he didn't get the chance to grieve and I think that many people found themselves in the same situation, especially after the war or after the Second World War as well. Um, the, the grieving process wasn't something that people would pay attention to or wouldn't care really the process of grieving and having to overcome trauma because the war is a trauma <laughs> but once again at the time psychology wasn't that far off advanced and uh, <laughs> sorry and those question really the brain is such a mystery really even today still that there are some behavior that we can't comprehend even in our 21st century then in a twin at the in the early 20th century then you can imagine that it was still there was so much to uh, learn from uh, the brain and uh, and how people react to trauma so and how people react differently it's, it's them there are some uh, soldiers or people who uh yeah soldiers who came back from the war and uh luckily had maybe the chance to have support or and, and didn't um and managed to carry on with their lives but others they didn't manage so yeah, it's heartbreaking, really. Okay, well, so this is it. This is it for uh, this live. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this live reading and make sure that uh, you subscribe for the book club um, to become a member and have the chance to discuss Discuss more about the novel and improve your English uh, through conversation and be part of this beautiful community as well. So I wish you a beautiful end of the day and I come back live at three o'clock, so in about 20 minutes, to read um reading to read section eight of the novel. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.